Human ambition is a staunch ally of man's ability to orders were received to set up a field surgical hospital in the village of Bromzavod, which was in fact a bromine factory. It was situated on the shore of the Sivash, the Rotten Sea, in the narrowest part of the Perikop Isthmus, which is only five kilometers long. The Sivash is extremely shallow, and when the west wind blows, the water leaves it altogether. Along the shore are large tubs covered with cement in which the seawater is evaporated in the sun. In many of them lay small heaps of salt, from which, in fact, bromine is extracted. The houses in the village had been partly destroyed by the fire of our artillery during the offensive two years before, but after a time the superintendent of agriculture in the neighborhood opened his office in the factory building and repaired several houses. It was decided to locate the operating theater in a large room of the stone building, a convenience we had not had for a long time. Next door to us was the divisional provision depot, and considering that for many years we had been on excellent terms with its chief, this was a weighty advantage. On the other hand, however, any cluster of large buildings was a desirable target for Russian bombers. There was no need for the officers to personally supervise the setting up of a field surgical hospital. Our men had such a wealth of experience in this matter that they were quite capable of doing everything themselves, and we had only to come to the ready. The hour left at our disposal before the flow of mangled bodies began to arrive could be compared to a short respite before going into the very heat of the desert. We always used it for a little refreshment. The cook cooked us chickens a la Henry IV, and on this night each man in the company got an individual chicken, the result of a mutually beneficial exchange with an agricultural official. The poor fellow was in the very epicenter of the coming battle, and he still had no orders to leave the area in question. When Crimea turned into a battlefield, his superiors disappeared in an undirection, and he was simply forgotten about in the rush. If he had travelled on his own without proper documents, he could easily have been arrested as a deserter, and then either shot or sent to the infantry. Since some time people have been sent to the infantry as a punishment, we got him a pass with the seal of the division on it, and in return he gave us a whole wealth. Forty cows, two hundred sheep, four hundred chickens, many quintals of honey, and several barrels of brandy made from Crimean wine. The cook's name was Aurea, and he was from Wisensee near Berlin. He had a bad reputation, well deserved, for washing less often than anyone else in the company. Even our senior sergeant could not compete with him, though he had an almost oriental aversion to it. Aurea's excuse was that Lad Six was a useful substance, in consequence of which he got his nickname of Lard Aurea. Nevertheless, he was a very good cook and displayed simply marvellous culinary art. He did not recognise any difficulties. At times when we hardly dared to smoke a cigarette in the darkness of night, Aurea was quite unconcerned about the cooker, and no matter what the circumstances, there was never a time when he did not have hot tea for the wounded. Laird Aurea was thus a respected man and a valued ally of the medical profession. Besides, he proved to be a very loyal chap. His girlfriend Lyshan was probably known to the whole company. Every time Aurea went home on leave, he was going to marry her. But each time it turned out that Lyshan he had given birth to a child that he couldn't be the father of, so each time the wedding was postponed again and again. He loved his Lyshan, but when he last returned from his holiday and was asked if he had finally married her, he replied briefly, I have decided to put the matter off until we win the war. While we were sitting at the table, the new chief of medical service of the division arrived. His lack of experience was immediately apparent as he began to resent our apparent indifference to his arrival. But before he could talk too much, Lard Aurier placed a whole chicken in front of him and also set down a whole mug of brandy. In this way we were able to avoid a pointless argument. Schnaff an hour later we began to operate. As usual, by the nature of the wounds, we tried to understand what was happening on the front line, but we were not successful. There seemed to be complete chaos. Apparently, at one point the Russians had succeeded in breaking through the Tater Rampart, and we began to receive wounded Slovaks, Romanians, Georgians, and Hungarians, 
If from our wounded we seldom heard even suppressed groans, these peasants and shepherds from Pushta and the Carpathians were unusually vocal. At the same time they also prayed aloud, which we very seldom heard from German soldiers. A few hours later we received a lieutenant who commanded a battery of 88mm anti-aircraft guns. He was only slightly wounded, but as there was no doctor on his battery, he wanted us to bandage him up. He told us that his battery was covering a large section of the front, as well as a sector that flanked the survivors. His battery was not covered by any infantry units, although of course his 88 mm anti-aircraft guns were modern weapons capable of rapid fire with a high degree of accuracy, and so could well be used to fire at ground targets. The wounded from our own division had completely fallen down. A number of wounded men came in with self-inflicted wounds. The men had shot themselves in the arm. In such cases, the entrance wound is characteristically colored. Black powder particles are visible around the wound, and the hair on the skin is burnt. Many experienced soldiers knew this, but from time to time the Russians dropped leaflets informing how a self-shot could be so committed as to make it appear plausible. But in practice this was almost impossible. An experienced expert could always recognize such a... All such cases had to be reported immediately to the commanding officer, and a court-martial usually followed, culminating in a sentence of execution. The first to be received with such a wound was a young peasant lad who had arrived from Germany only three days before, after training of only a few weeks. I examined his wound carefully. Its edges were burnt and covered with black powder claws. I touched it gently with a swab. It was not contaminated. Then I looked at the patient. He looked about 18 years old, not even a moustache yet. It was clear that he was just desperate to be in the thick of the battle. It was also clear that he had no idea that such an act could cost him his life. I thought for a moment. Harman looked at me attentively. Sergeant Fush, who already had his mask and bottle of ether at the ready, raised his face and stared at the patient's arm to determine the area I was about to operate on. Both at once realized what had caused the wound. Pensively, I raised my eyebrows. If there were to be a spate of self-inflicted gunshots, which, given the current situation at the front, was not out of the question, then we were all dead. I had fallen into my own trap. From the very beginning of the war, I'd had urged all members of our surgical team to follow the principles of humanism and to be worthy of these high principles. I often referred to my surgical knife as the Hippocratic scalpel, and as time went on, my subordinates became so accustomed to this phrase that they themselves began to use it constantly. I was also able to explain to them what a great man Hippocrates was. So my assistant and the anaesthetist exchanged glances, then Sergeant Fush, scratching his huge nose with his anaesthetic mask. And only the ancient hypocrites could judge correctly here, and began to moisten the mask with ether. Herman handed me a scalpel. I removed all traces of the self-shot in the only way available, by simply cutting them out, after which the wound became quite extensive. In this way I had saved the life of a young German peasant in the Russian steppe but the fighting that followed that winter left less and less opportunity to follow the precepts of the great Hippocrate. With short interruptions, we operated throughout the night until the following afternoon. The situation at the front became more and more threatening. Chokim, who had already become a lieutenant, dropped by during one of these breaks. He had come straight from the advanced first aid post on the Tatiski rampart. He too, who always looked fresh and well-groomed and always in good spirits, had not slept for three nights, and so now looked very depressed. I realized that this was not due to purely physical fatigue. He was somewhat cheered up by the coffee, which was always on hand in the operating theater, after which we sat down on the crate. He realized that I wanted to find out from him how things were at the front. He wanted to tell me something encouraging, but he would not deceive me, as I could compare his information with what I had from other sources. Thanks to the virtuoso work of the ambulance drivers, we had time to evacuate all the people who were being operated on, but their places were immediately taken by 40 to 60 new wounded who were waiting for their turn on stretchers near the operating theater. Lieutenant Josham believed that, barring a miracle, the present front line could not be held for long. He also believed 
that the Russians had concentrated a large number of tanks on the opposite side of the Tater Berm. When they attacked us, they could break through our defences in an hour. Although the members of our operations brigade did not hear our conversation, they knew exactly what we were talking about. We understood each other at a glance. Danger was just in the air. At that moment, Sergeant Meyer came in and said that an armoured train had arrived and stopped on the tracks that led to the Bromine factory. We all turned pale. In the dead silence that immediately followed, Corporal Kubanki, it would be nice to know whose armoured train it is, Russian or German. The tension was released. Everyone began to laugh. Of course, it was a German armoured train. I approached its commander, a young engineer lieutenant. It was early evening. I asked him what he was doing here and he said he didn't know. He had received orders from division headquarters to take up a position in front of the Bromzavod and to wait in full combat readiness for further orders. So were things really so bad at the front? Was this armoured train the last hope of the division command and with its help it hoped to hold the isthmus at least for a few more hours? I rang for Breezy. Metzwerm, thank you very much for the armoured train. Now I would like to send you some orchids, actually, but at the moment I can't send you anything but the armoured train. That's very kind of you. Thank you very much. But what does all this really mean? It's in a voice with which one mate could explain to another mate that he would not come to visit him tonight because of the bad weather, Fabricius was. Apparently the Russians are going to land a landing with small boats on the Black Sea coast, somewhere near you. If the landing starts, you will have at least two hours to evacuate with the help of this armoured train. Much obliged. Two hours. How's it going? Excellent. We stressed each syllable. Fabricius hung up. We made all the preparations necessary for the emergency evacuation of the surgical field hospital and then continued to operate. But I had a feeling that something important was about to happen very soon. To Nornberg, the second surgeon, told me the next morning that all night long he had had the same feeling. If we had less than half an hour to spare, the minimum time required to complete the operation, in the event of an alarm, it could ruin us all. So we set up a second operating table. While one wounded man was being operated on the first table, the other was being prepared for surgery on the other table. We worked as fast as possible, concentrated and silent. They worked without breaks, talking or cigarettes all night long. The evacuation of the wounded was carried out without a hitch, and by 5 a.m., the last of the wounded had left the operating table. Let the Russians come now. There was, however, no sign of their approach. We went out into the fresh air, dawn was breaking, and the whole area was wrapped in a salutary mist. The company could stay here at least one more night. I slept for several hours. On the line of the Tartar rampart that morning there was relative calm. We received only a few wounded before noon. I went to the division headquarters. Tabritius and the general commanding the division shared a small manor house on the outskirts of the village. Entering the house, one went straight into a room lined with maps. Fabricius was sitting on the table, his shoulders slumped. He chewed an extinguished cigarette and looked out of the window from time to time. He did not hear me enter the room. The window faced north and from it I could see almost the whole of the road leading towards the Bromzevod. The window was covered by a curtain and a bunch of five-hand grenades peeped out from behind it. With skillful handling and a certain amount of luck it was quite possible to disable a tank by hitting its track. I called out to Fabricius and he turned slowly in my direction. His face was completely blank. It was neither serious nor alarmed. It simply expressed no emotion. Apparently, he hadn't even heard my words. Then suddenly, his expression changed immediately. He smiled, but even his smile was rather sluggish. He threw off his stupor and his smile became truly friendly. It was probably in a state of complete mental and physical exhaustion. We were not given a chance to greet each other properly. The commander of the engineering unit entered. He had just arrived from Kerch, and his arrival broke the cordiality with which two old battle comrades usually meet after a long separation. Tabricius turned to him with a smile, which he never managed to remove from his face.
and ask, where are your units? One company is two kilometers from here, and the other will arrive this afternoon. Two engineer companies was certainly better than nothing at all. I expected Fabrizius to let out a sigh of relief, but nothing of the sort happened. Pointing to the map, he explained to the newly arrived commander the situation on their section of the front. One of his companies was to cover the right flank of a battery of 88mm anti-aircraft guns. The other was to take what seemed to be a no-go position further south, on the bank of the Sivash, far from the front line. The commander looked at Fabricius in amazement. What am I going to do there? he asked. Fabricius, with a friendly smile on his face, continued. As I am going to invite a Russian landing party to visit you tomorrow morning. The Russians will be very pleased if you meet them properly. At dawn the next day the Russians began to land exactly where the chief of staff had ordered the company to take up defense. During the previous few nights the Russians, with the help of German prisoners of war, had paved a track across the marsh. As it lay thirty centimeters below the water level, it could not be seen during the day. Fabricius understood quite correctly the meaning of the night sounds that came to us during the construction of the road. Then the engineering commander asked, Now tell me, Fabricius, is the situation really as hopeless as it seems? But Fabricius evaded a direct answer and went into a three-minute explanation of the advantages of the positions the newly arrived commander was charged with defending. He practiced his skill to perfection. He emphasized some of our tactical advantages, showed them with an important look on the map, and the engineer left, convinced that all was not so bad. This same scene was repeated three more times over the next few minutes as other unit commanders entered the room. In an incomprehensible way, the utterly exhausted man exuded confidence, hope and courage that was transmitted to the others. An officer of the general staff always knows more than a frontline commander. On many previous occasions, Fabricius had always masterfully played out such situations. If the chief of staff of the division says, but who could calm down the chief of staff of the division, and how to calm a man who knew the true state of affairs? At that moment, the division commander entered the room. He was covered with mud from head to toe, as he had been crawling all night along the Tater Rampart from one battalion commander to another. He asked me how the treatment of the wounded was going, and I assured him that everything was all right. Well, at least that's all right. I have other things to worry about. But wait, come into my place. I've got some good old brandy left. He knew perfectly well what mood people were in, but he could only ask me about it when we were alone together. The general took me under his arm, and we went into the adjoining little room in which he lived. Then he poured brandy into glasses. So, doctor, in a surgical field hospital you always know very well what the situation is. What is the prevailing mood in the troops at the moment? I sat directly opposite him, looking him in the face, just as Lieutenant Joachim had sat in front of me the previous night. But there was one difference. I actually needed accurate information, and the general didn't. He already knew everything perfectly well. All he needed was to find peace himself, even though he had been doing nothing but calming the others all the time. So I told him that the infantrymen were very unhappy about the lack of artillery support and poor food, but that their will to resist was unwavering. That was not entirely true. But perhaps even a general has limits, and despite all the difficulties, there must be a spark of hope in his soul. The general reacted to my story in exactly the way I had vainly expected Fabricius to, with a sigh of relief. This is the first good news I've had in three days. Let's have another drink. I probably should have felt ashamed, but I got my drink the same way a doctor gets money from a patient for advising him to take his medication at a strictly prescribed time even though he knows for a fact that he will probably die the next day. Chassis Company commanders report an increase in self-inflicted gunshots. Have you ever seen one? Only once. Did you file a report? If you've already started lying, lie all the way through. It was the devil's revenge for my meddling in my own affairs. I decided to take a risk. No, Hera General, I didn't write a report. Why not?
He was a young peasant lad who'd arrived at the front from a reserve battalion only three days before. He was just temporarily insane. He didn't realize what he was doing. I didn't want a superior officer to sign his death warrant. Such superior officer was none other than the general himself. He smiled. You're a sly one. Well, let's just say I don't know anything about it. Then I told the general a wonderful story about an agricultural administrator. I brought some fried chickens with me. Sabricius again took up his favorite position on the card table and stared at the village street. I sat down opposite him and pointed to the ruined factory. A beautiful view from the window. Fabricius picked up the bundle of grenades thoughtfully. Someone else might just as well have picked up a fragment of sculpture to get a better look at it. He took out the fuse and played with the ring, which popped right off. I looked at him with a smile. Well, of course, if you feel like it, there's no reason why you shouldn't be packing. He shook his head. No, no. Have you forgotten? I'm an old soldier, 17th Infantry Regiment. I can destroy at least one tank before I leave here. Nay, come on, Fabricius. Let's take a walk round the house. That's a marvellous idea. We left the mansion, which stood on the outskirts of the village, and went straight into the steppe. May, can you keep your mouth shut? I clicked my heels. Hmm, I'll be as grave as the grave, Herr Colonel. So will I. And with this joke, which Frederick the Great once played with an inquisitive general, began our conversation, which is etched in my memory. Hmm, so what's next for us? Nothing, it's already over. You mean there's no chance we can hold out here much longer? Not a chance. We're out of ammunition. The infantry is completely exhausted. The Russians have brought in tanks. When they start advancing, they can break right through to Simferopol in one bu- We've done enough. Our only chance is if you don't surrender, Colonel. Three days ago, the situation was much bleaker than it is now. You're absolutely right, but I've completely lost to the Chief of Staff. Chief of Staff, it can't be that you issue meaningless orders, and after all, the corps commander should not interfere in your affairs. You know the army commander well, and he knows you well. So the army commander is a consummate master of tactical operations, and he knows perfectly well all the peculiarities of warfare in Russia. But I'm talking about the other chief of staff, the Russian. He knows his business very well. You know him. For three days, I played with him a game resembling chess, only instead of pieces on the board we used combat units and armoured vehicles. For every move I made, he immediately made the correct counter-move. I had the feeling that my former colleague from the General Staff Academy was sitting behind the front line. And perhaps that's the way it really is. What do you mean? It could be someone from the National Committee. No bloody hell. I didn't even think of that. We knew from the leaflets the Russians had been throwing over our positions that some of the officers who had been captured at Stalingrad had become communists. After a moment's silence, Fabricius said, What an abomination. Everything that goes on around us is a great misfortune. In fact, it makes no difference which side you fight on. You're still serving a wrong cause. Walking a little further along the steppe, Fabricius stopped again. Tell me, how did we ever get into such a meat grinder? To die here, like rats. You know, Colonel, no one is immune from dying in war. But we can both die here on the steppe eh? only if the stars will... Sabricius looked at me thoughtfully. No, no, you are quite right. Our stars don't promise us that. He put his arm round my shoulders, and so side by side we walked across the rain-slick steppe. We came to the road that led to the village of Bromsavod. Then, about two hundred metres away, we spotted a desperate driver pushing his motorbike in our direction. Mark my words, said Fabricius. He's carrying a message that the Russian tanks are on the offensive. A fam defeatist. I'll bet a bottle of cognac if he says anything else. The man who was pushing his motorbike across the scattered steppe turned out to be as if we had been impatiently waiting for him. A messenger from the Oracle of Delphi. Fabricius took the message from him, read it, and then handed it to me.
It was a submission from the company commander requesting that the Iron Cross First Class be awarded to a former corporal who had distinguished himself in service. It was a marvellous moment. We looked at each other and laughed. We had been saved. Within an hour, the First Class Iron Cross was on its way to its rightful owner. As an additional prize, we also sent a bottle of cognac along with it. Both then returned to their immediate duties. Half an hour later, three bombers crossed the Tatar rampart and dropped their bombs on the Russian tanks concentrated to attack behind it. Three weeks later, Fabricius confided to me that the messenger of the Delphic Oracle had appeared just in time. It was he who had given him the right idea. After twenty unsuccessful attempts to contact the aerodrome, Fabricius decided to make one last attempt and headed there himself. As luck would have it, he was met by the squadron commander himself. He simply explained to him that now there was no time to wait for a corresponding order from his superiors. If he did not fly out now, by nightfall the Russian tanks would already be on the aerodrome. In war, sometimes there are such critical situations when the fate of the whole front depends on the decisive actions of just one man, and then success comes. In those days we did not yet know that success at the Tower Rampart was the beginning of the end of the whole army. A few days after the memorable conversation in the steppe, the division headquarters moved to Piatikatka, a village located right on the Isthmus, one of those small, miserable villages where in Saras times migrants from other regions lived. Because of the threat of air raids on the sturdy stone building near Bromsevod, we moved the field surgical hospital to the premises on Ishuni, formerly occupied by the division headquarters, and settled in Vorontsovka, four kilometers to the south. Vorontsovka was once the estate of Count Vorontsov. At the end of the XVI century, Vorontsov for many years was the Russian ambassador to Steve James's court. His son grew up in England, was educated at Oxford, and after the death of his father returned to Russia, and on the southern coast of the Crimea built a kind of Vesalis palace. When the last Countess Vorontsov died, Hundreds of valuable dresses and costumes were left behind her, and these were shown before the war to visitors, to the palace as a horrible specimen of the excesses of the ruling feudal class. A large number of fine Greek sculptures remained in the house. They were dug out of the ground when the garden was laid out, which descends in separate terraces directly to the sea. Each time we chose our accommodation from the point of view that we could most easily evacuate from it. During the retreat, our other most important task being the evacuation of the wounded, the hospital did not perform operations in places from which it would be impossible to remove our patients. As a result of the German breakthrough through the Perikop Isthmus in 1941, the Soviet troops were split into two groups. One of them was retreating towards Sevastopol and the other towards Kerch. There was no doubt that a similar situation could be repeated this time. The Russians were using Kerch as a staging post for further retreat. That is why we chose Vorontsovka, which lay a little to the southwest of the Isthmus. We could retreat southwards or towards the sea and eventually reach Sevastop. In such situations, neither the rules governing the treatment of the wounded nor the instructions of the chief of corps, medical service, could help. There was no time for surgery during the retreat. During the next fortnight, some new reinforcements continued to arrive. The front line along the Tartar berm stabilized again, and during the lull, daily life went on as usual. However, the troops no longer felt relatively safe as they had during the summer on the Taman Peninsula. Somewhere beyond the horizon line lurked a constant threat. Even in times of calm, the medical company had many concerns. During such periods, the company was assigned no less than 19 different assignments. The most important concern was the field surgical hospital, which had 20 beds for the seriously wounded, and a separate ward with 40 beds for the likely wounded, or just. We also had two dental surgeries, four chemical laboratories that to be used in the event of a chemical attack, a dispensary, an observation ward for the mentally disturbed or self-inflicted, and a mobile unit to attend to the sick in the field. We had to supply the medical staff at the forward posts, where the wounded were picked up by ambulances and brought to us. In addition, our company sometimes had to allocate people for other tasks. 
such as carrying the wounded from the battlefield. I must say that the casualties among the medics were even higher than among the soldiers of the infantry units. It was understandable that the wounded had to be pulled out of the areas where the fiercest fighting was going on. When one of our corporals was sent as an orderly to the front line, he always returned to us very quickly. But as a wounded man, people were extremely reluctant to accept such assignments. In addition to all these duties, we had to assist the veterinary company, the repair company, the personnel of the armored train, and the Georgian volunteer battalion. One of our officers was responsible for the medical care of some 3,000 local civilians. He was nicknamed the List Doctor. This area was also the responsibility of the combat commander, who had to ensure the preservation of the defenses set up here. Then we had to secure the famous bridge over the Shitalik, just south of Ishuni. Our sergeant in charge of the stables spent almost all his time in the interior of the isthmus, preparing exceptionally good fodder for the horses. Our company's area of responsibility covered an area with a radius of over 20 kilometers. When the Russians failed to break through Perikop in a sudden rush, they bypassed the Crimea, and soon, for the first time in a long time, their offensive was halted on the Dnieper. Within just one year, the Red Army had managed to recapture almost all the territory that the German army had captured during the summer campaigns of 1941 and 1942. The front line was rapidly approaching our own borders. It's the sense of security which had been based on the fact that we had vast tracts of conquered land in reserve was fading away. The sense of superiority which had long characterized the German soldier was also fading away. The boomerang was returning. All this affected the psychological state of the troops fighting on the Eastern Front. When an army suffers one defeat after another, its morale gradually weakens. But the success of the Russians had another consequence, completely forgotten the reason for which the war began. The struggle has acquired a completely different meaning, and now nothing could change it. The Red Army was advancing steadily further and further westwards, and no one could say with certainty where it would now stop. Now there was no doubt that because of political miscalculations, the war in the East had taken on a completely different meaning for the troops. They were now defending their own country. The longer we can hold off the Russian offensive in the East, the further the troops of the Western powers can advance. The dream of meeting the Japanese in Karachi was, of course, naive. But the dream of meeting the British somewhere on the Wessel was now becoming cherished, which most of Europe joined, along with Germany, seven years after the end of the war, originated in the Russian steppes. So the dictator's behavior became more and more unpredictable. This is one of the symptoms of hysteria, and it was especially noticeable among the fanatics around him, many of whom were clearly suffering from schizophrenia, they were unable to recognize their own mistake. Hysteria is common to many women, and it usually passes without much consequence. But the consequences of hysteria in men are the darkest and bloodiest events in history. The fact that most people do not believe that hysteria also occurs in men makes its consequences even more dangerous. After ten years of terror by which the dictator ruled his homeland, he was afraid that this terror might breed opposition to himself having created nothing worthwhile during ten years of rule, but only made a mass of enemies, he now had a great fear of them. I spent the night in Vorontsovka, and in the morning I received a call from the military prosecutor of our division. He was not only a very qualified lawyer, but also a very learned man, and so strictly and expertly monitored the observance of military laws that he earned himself the sincere respect of the whole division. He looked at life with a certain degree of skepticism, which is generally characteristic of the Saxon mentality. We established friendly relations with him, thanks to our similar ways of thinking, although we did not talk about them much. He managed to make many unbearable things quite bearable. He was a former artilleryman, and one of the last members of the First World War still serving with the division. Mm, I am calling you, he said, as you are accused of looting. Fur boots from Vladislavovka. So the holder of the Order of Stilbrich did not keep his word. Probably he wanted to get some new award. I laughed. However, the lawyer said there was nothing funny about it. I must come to him immediately.
so I went to Yeshun. The military prosecutor met me in a rather friendly manner, however. When we sat down at the table, he became serious, even very serious. He read out the testimony of an eyewitness. I smiled and asked if his feet were warm. A little surprised, he looked at his boots. He had long forgotten about this little episode that had taken place in Sheikh Ali. Thus, the military prosecutor, the division commander and its chief of staff were involved in this case. In some confusion, he ran his hand over his bald head. Almighty God, what a story. Fortunately, I still had the delivery note, which was given to me by the Luftwaffe intendant, and also found many witnesses who confirmed that the warehouses were burned the next day. All these details were as yet unknown to the military prosecutor, but when he learnt of them, he said with a somewhat puzzled look, I will not give a hoot to the report of the field gendarme in which he accuses you of sabotage. That was the end of the matter. The military prosecutor invited me to visit with him the flat of the chief of the medical service of the division. It was his birthday today, and probably each of us was entitled to a glass of vodka. On the way, he and I discussed the question of how long the Russians would allow us to use those fur boots when we were sent to Siberia. The lawyer thought that they would leave them forever. The Russians had better boots than ours. The friendly company encamped just in front of the house occupied by the chief of the medical service of the division. It was warm, and a light haze was covering the ground, not at all suitable weather for air raids. The division commander had just learnt that the unit entrusted to him had been awarded a commendation from the Supreme Command for excellent service. He was proud of himself. While we were sitting and drinking, a very young junior lieutenant medical officer approached the chief of the medical service. He was a strong, well-built guy who was going home on leave and had to leave Crimea by plane the next morning. The military prosecutor sat next to me. We both looked at the junior lieutenant. We could consider that he had already been saved. Then we looked at each other. Did we envy him? As far as we could see his buttonholes, he had no honours at all. He would fly off to Germany, and we would stay in the cauldron. The military prosecutor remarked, Let him fly. We have already seen something in this life, and he still has everything ahead of him. From my point of view, he can go. We drank to each other's health and decided not to be envious. The chief of medical service of the division offered the young officer a glass of vodka. It was probably too early for him to start drinking. He was only a young man, but he could not refuse to drink to his commander's health. He held the glass in his hand at some distance from himself, and at the same time looked at us with a glance that clearly showed condemnation of these old men who were sitting here drinking schnapps. Sir military lawyer caught this look, and being a Saxon humanist, decided to enlighten him in the most accessible way he could by quoting an inscription inscribed on a memorial stone in honour of the Spartans who fell in the gorge near Thermopylae. I, me, so my dear lieutenant, when you return to Germany, eh? And uttered a phrase in Greek. The young lieutenant looked at him with surprise. Did you understand anything? No. The division medical chief raised his glass and repeated the same quote, but in Latin, Dick Hospies, Sparte knows the his vidis I icanti, dum sanctis patria legibus obsequimu. But the young officer did not know Latin either. Summarizing all this conversation, the prosecutor said quietly, If he also does not understand Latin, he must surely save himself to learn it. A few weeks later, people were allowed to go home again on holiday. Those who went home got from Sevastopol to Odessa by boat and then, if they were lucky, flew by plane directly to their homeland. Former fighters joked that Crimea was the most modern prison in the world. Years later I found out that Churchill had said the same thing about Crete. Christmas came, our third Christmas in Russia. People dreamed so passionately of peace that they almost forgot about it. Filled with grief, they sat around candles and wondered when it would all end. From time to time we went to visit each other, as we had done throughout the previous years. In Piatihatka, Van Hagen did the impossible. He converted one of the houses into a bathhouse, but because of the constant threat of shelling, the bath was built right into the floor.
but the situation had changed. The future was painted to us in increasingly gloomy colors. We were waiting for an order to start preparing a general evacuation from the Crimea. However, such an order never came. Only party functionaries were evacuated from the insert. One day I had to go on business to Sevastopol. The Russian doctors, whom we had released from detention in 1942, were still working at the hospital, and I had a cup of tea with them. When I was about to leave, the Russian chief surgeon walked me to the exit, and I asked him if he was afraid that when the Soviets returned he might be accused of collaborating with the Germans. He was not afraid of that, most likely. He had long ago established contacts with the partisans operating in the Crimean mountains, and who could condemn him for this? After all, it was his own people. When we were saying goodbye, he told me with a kind smile that I need not worry about that, that Russians also need good surgeons. We shook hands. We were both soldiers serving under the invisible flag. I am just sure that this noble man saved the lives of hundreds of German soldiers when the Russians reoccupied Sevastopol. We never had the chance to meet again, but we will never forget each other. In the fourth year of the war, any German soldier fighting on the Eastern Front began to realize that he was defending his homeland against the Red Army, and this thought increased his will to resist. Did he realize that the leaders of his country were leading it to disaster? The mistakes of the high command had been repeated so often that they were now obvious to all. The cynicism of some breeds reciprocal cynicism in others. The troops began to mock those who had died in battle, those who were left lying unburied in the steppe. The unbending will to resist of the soldiers and officers surrounded near Point X will always serve as a guiding beacon lighting the path to victory for the German army and people. It was a standard phrase. One morning, as Mokassin and I walked out of the door of our cabin, he inhaled the air loudly and said, What a strange odor there is here. What is the odor? The fire on the guiding beacon? By and large, Mokassin was right, though the joke turned out to be very sinister. In the back of their minds, the soldiers began to wonder how many more human lives would have to be sacrificed to save our country, and whether everyone should be prepared to be sacrificed. Only a year ago, I doubted whether I should go on holiday just before the offensive began. Now a holiday has become a legitimate means of avoiding at least another disaster. I had an unfortunate fall from my horse and injured something in the upper part of my spine. It was impossible to determine at once what had happened, because the X-ray machines had already been evacuated from Simferopol. Eventually the general allowed me to go on leave. I postponed my departure from week to week. To return after the holidays to an isolated center of resistance would have been the height of madness. I wanted to take a chance and take a full holiday. If the Russians suddenly launched an offensive, all holidays would probably be cancelled. But if such an offensive was actually being prepared, signs of it could always be detected, no matter how much the enemy tried to hide them. In this gloomy atmosphere, one ray of light flashed. The story of a humble railway engine in front of the Tatar rampart, on the neutral strip between German and Russian positions, on the railway line leading towards Kherson, two wagons were abandoned. One day, a German patrol examined their contents and discovered that they contained incredible treasures. The wagons were stuffed to the roof with cigarettes, cigars, chocolate and vodka. Was it possible to get them out of there? There were several side branches, by which they could be transported to the main line. It was in working condition, as an armoured train was moving along it, but the fact was that the switches were close to the wire fences of the Russians, but during one or two inclement nights our engineers were able to repair them. It was now necessary to find an experienced railway engineer, and such a one was found in Simferop. He quite met all the requirements. However, he was not a military and civilian specialist, but during the First World War, he served in one of the engineering units and was awarded the Iron Cross Second Class. Attached to his blue cap was an oak leaf emblem, a symbol of his 25 years of sterling service to the railway. When asked if he could pull two carriages to safety with a small steam train, he said he probably could. And so one dark, moonless night, the little steam train set off on its journey.
It was a plucky little steam locomotive once made in Castle and had served faultlessly for at least fifty years. In the control cabin stood an old railway man, accompanied by a young armoured train commander. Very carefully, the little locomotive travelled along the tracks to where the wire fences of the Russians began. The arrow was switched, and the steam locomotive went over to the side track, and then two wagons were hitched to it, taking every precaution. It touched off on its return journey. The arrow was switched again, and the train hurried forward on the main line. Nothing terrible happened. Already, when the freight train reached the German positions, the engineer turned to the commander of the armoured train and asked, Can I give the horn? And just a hundred metres away from the Russian wire fences, a powerful steam locomotive horn sounded. The Russians probably thought that the devil himself had come to them. The engineer put on steam and sped away. By the time the Russians started firing, he was safe. The whole Crimea severed of the details of the story. The general had the wonderful idea of awarding him a bar in addition to the Iron Cross. But, since the division could not find any of them, the military prosecutor solemnly handed him his own during the search for this bar. It turned out that at the beginning of the war there were a great number of them. They tried to reward soldiers who had already served in the army during the First World War. Initially they were made as badges for participants of party congresses, but since after the outbreak of war the congresses were no longer convened, they were simply transferred to the army. January was coming to an end. One morning when I was still asleep, Mokassim came into my room and began to pack my suitcase. I asked him why he was up so early. He looked at me very seriously and said, Yes, spring is coming. What do you fix? I just saw the first swallows. Swallows? Russian aeroplanes. Three aeroplanes have been flying over us all morning. The Russians are awake. Are you sure they're not our planes? Oh, they're ours. Why would they be here? That's how I went on holiday. I left with a sense of guilt but I left nonetheless. When I was saying goodbye to the military prosecutor, he said, Give my regards to Laconia. I don't want to see you here again. I boarded an aeroplane at the aerodrome at Sarabusa. We took off into the air. Below us lay the Crimea, under the sunlight glistened mountains. I knew all the villages over which we flew. I once again looked at the snow-covered step which has become a mass grave for many people who were once my friends, I looked again and again at the vast expanse that stretched to the horizon line, which in spring would once again be covered with the colourful grasses. I never saw the step again. Fortunately, the plane I was flying was not an old anti-U, but a Heinkel 111 bomber. Barely had we reached the edge of the Black Sea when we were attacked by two Russian fighters, with incomprehensible speed. The experienced air gunners took their places at the machine guns and began to fire everything that was at hand. The Russian aeroplanes disappeared, so over the sea the sun shone so blindingly that it hurt to look. As we approached the big land, we saw a cloud layer about 250 meters thick hanging just above the coastal cliffs. We flew over Odessa, but it was impossible to land there. If the weather reports were to be believed, Thick fog covered the surface of the land as far as the Carpathians. The plane flew along the line of an easily recognizable road between Nikolaev and Odessa, although we could see the ground only occasionally in the breaks in the clouds. There was little fuel left in the tanks of the plane, and the pilot almost decided to return back to Crimea, but then he found a gap in the clouds and was able to land at the aerodrome in Nikolaev. So I was on the big land, with my division or rather, with what was left of it. I was next destined to meet only in Germany. After my spine was examined with the help of an X-ray machine in one of the hospitals in Munich, the surgeon came out of the darkness with a still wet photograph in his hands and with a strong Bavarian accent. My dear colleague, your neck is broken, your neck is broken. Then, satisfied with the diagnosis, he waddled away on a wooden leg that he had inherited from the First World War. My neck wasn't actually broken, but one of my vertebrae had developed a crack and had to have cartilage removed. Five weeks later, I had an attack of appendicitis. The Russians began their offensive on the Crimea, 
and on my way to the front I had to make a change at Vienna. But before I got on the train I went to see a doctor who worked at the Vienna Ostbahnhof railway station, my Austrian colleague politely inquired. Are you heading for the front or are you going home? To the front. Where to? Met to the Crimea. With a somewhat enigmatic smile, he replied, Well, my dear friend, you wouldn't believe how many attacks of appendicitis occur in people who go to the front, and none in those who go home. Strange, isn't it? I laugh. It's none of your business whether I go to the front or not. Without any doubt, it was appendicitis. I had previously felt several mild attacks, and the next day I had an operation. I firmly believe that this acute attack of appendicitis was caused by inner fear and was a kind of reaction of the nervous system. Such a symptom is called locus minoris resistentia. While I was lying in the hospital in Vienna, the first wounded from the Crimea began to arrive there. A typhus epidemic broke out in the hospital, and the medical authorities panicked. The lice-infested Crimean wounded who had brought typhus with them were distributed to various rear hospitals without any disinfection, so we were all in quarantine. After some time I was transferred to a reserve battalion stationed in Berlin. By that time it was all over in the Crimea. The 17th Army had ceased to exist. It was a catastrophe that in some ways surpassed even the disaster at Stalingrad, and in this case the high command showed its complete indifference to the fate of ordinary soldiers. The infantrymen, who until the last covered the places where troops were loaded onto the ships, were simply abandoned to their fate. When they realized they had been betrayed, they fired their remaining ammunition at the departing ships and then put their hands up and surrendered. Thousands of wounded men, all the surrounding fields were strewn with them, were abandoned near the embarkation points of the troops on the ships. The remnants of our division arrived by train to Germany from Romania, among the losses suffered by our company, listed and Sergeant Meyer. He was on the ship leaving Sevastopol at the moment when it was hit by a bomb and drowned with several of our best men. The division was placed in barracks in the neighborhood of Berlin. The men were forbidden to talk about what they had seen in the Crimea. Indeed, they were told that they could not even discuss it among themselves. This completely destroyed the remnants of the faith in victory that still smoldered in them. All individual unit commanders were simultaneously transferred to other units. It is difficult to say how far this measure was justified, but the division, which was treated so shamefully, was completely demoralized. However, we did not have long to enjoy peace and quiet in the cozy little towns and villages of Brandenburg. The division received fresh replenishment and then loaded onto the trains. The last act of the tragedy had begun. We were again on the train. At first we were going north and rumours began to circulate that the division was being sent to Norway, but soon the train turned east. Somewhere near Minsk the Red Army broke through our defences and headed west. As the train was moving very slowly, there was chaos at all the stations. There were not enough steam locomotives. Sometimes I had to talk to transport officials for hours so that the train could move forward just a little. I was just sure that the division would be thrown into battle at once, and until we arrived at our destination there was little need for the services of medic, by curses, threats and bribes. I managed to get the train taken off the reserve tracks from time to time, and gradually we began to approach the front line. One day, Returning after a long conversation with the transport official to the place where our train had previously stood, I found that it had disappeared. But in the lone figure standing on the railway tracks I recognized Sambo, with his motorbike beside him. Hermann had dropped him off the train with his steed at the very last moment. We took the motorbike in the direction in which Sambo had seen the train disappear. We had to ride either on the sleepers or next to the railway tracks. It was a real circus act. At one point a steam train began to catch up with us from behind, and we had to pull aside in a hurry. I raised my hand, and even Sambo, who had not a single muscle trembling, was very pleased when the locomotive stopped, and the driver drove us about twenty kilometres. Finally, towards evening, we were able to catch up with our train, following the highway that stretched along the railway track. Everyone started laughing and waving when they noticed their missing boss.
sweaty and tired, sitting on the back of Sambo's motorbike. After returning to my goods wagon, I felt as if I had returned to my ancestral home. After that, whenever I went out to the station to gather information, we always put out a whole group of observers so that I had a constant link with the train. The nearer the front line was, the clearer it became that a terrible catastrophe had occurred. Large numbers of soldiers who had been separated from their units came up to our field kitchen to get a hot meal for the first time in many days, and then they told us that there was no longer any organized retreat and the troops were simply running away. Already several trains with fresh resupply had fallen straight into the hands of the Russians. The orders for the route of the trains which were passed on through the railway station commanders went in such a roundabout way that by the time the troops reached their destination, the situation could have already changed radically. Being a responsible person, and having no reliable information about the situation at the front, I had to decide for myself where our journey would end. If we travelled too far, we would be captured by the Russians. If we unloaded from the train too early, I would have to answer before a military tribunal for not following orders. There were no instructions which clearly regulated how far a commander's authority extended in such circumstances, and the fact that no such instructions were ever issued was one symptom of the further decay of the army. In this case, the commanders of troops in the field could do nothing to help, as they had no such authority. The Supreme Command did not do so for the simple reason that then it would have become clear to everyone that the situation was becoming catastrophic. The party refused to recognize the obvious fact that the matter was coming to a head. Such an approach was typical of party functionaries in general. They believed in a miracle. We can only win the war if we believe in victory, therefore if we believe in victory, we will win the war. They tried to influence the situation with spells. The troops chanted the slogan, the wheels must turn towards victory, while referring to a steam locomotive that had been in a wreck and lay broken under an embankment. The discrepancy between reality and reality, which had characterized the life of the country for ten years, now became characteristic of the army. The silence was broken by the bursting of a Russian artillery shell. We were somewhere east of Grotno. The train ahead of us had to stop when a direct hit from a cannon killed the locomotive driver, but fortunately our train pulled up at a small platform at the station, and the men were able to leave the train in record time. Just as in our time at the Cuban bridgehead, we formed two mobile operating brigades, one of these groups and with it all the transport and luggage, I immediately sent to the rear, and the other went to the castle, located one and a half kilometers from the railway station. There we opened a field surgical hospital. Just in front of us a battery of six-inch howitzers on horse-drawn traction was being unloaded from the train. It could only be unloaded under cover of infantry, and it immediately went into action. It fired some impressive volleys at the Russians. But when after a while the battery decided to change position, it was discovered that the horses had disappeared. The battery managed to move to the new position without them, but towards evening these guns were seized by the Russians, turned them round and opened fire on the village adjoining the park near our castle. I went in search of the division headquarters. It was not easy to find it, and I could not even imagine where it might be. Right in front of us were the Russians, so I travelled in a northeastern direction. Fortunately, I had a map, and I had also brought Herman with me. He had a special sense of finding just the right place, and besides, he was an excellent driver. It was fortunate to be accompanied by such an experienced person with whom you could discuss the pros and cons of any decision. We were travelling in a small open car. We had three handguns with us. Sambo was riding beside us on his motorbike. The area around us was deserted. The harvest was not over. We passed through one village in which we did not notice a single living soul. For the second time in five years, war had swept across this beautiful, rich and fertile land. To reach the next village we had to cross a rather large stretch of dense forest. So we unholstered our machine guns and drove them left and right through the open windows of the car. The partisans were much more active in the vast forests that covered the central section of the eastern front than in the steppes, where there was nowhere to hide. We passed through the forest without incident.
and on reaching the village on its opposite side. It was occupied by a bakery. We quickly put away our weapons. When Sambo was returning by the same road in the afternoon, he was fired upon, but fortunately not hit. We did manage to find the headquarters after all. Van Hagen bowed his head in greeting. The familiar orderlies and staff sergeant Birnbaum, the chief clerk of the headquarters, who we had once solemnly promoted to chief clerk of the general staff, shook hands with us joyfully, familiar faces. We knew that we could rely on each other, since the division had lost the most experienced senior officers, who knew their duties very well, we rallied even more. Naturally, I brought a bottle of vodka with me. It was one of my pleasant duties. Said the vision was in the thick of the battle, and yet had no medical service of its own. Another medical company, which had arrived before us, had disembarked from the train somewhere far away from the location of the main parts of our division. It was assisting the field surgeons of our neighbours. All of them were overworked beyond measure. Staff Sergeant Birnbaum immediately sat down at his typewriter. Captain, paragraph 11 of the division order, the field surgical hospital will be stationed. I showed Van Hagen on the map where our train was parked. It was outside the division's area. I had to send Sambo back to call a surgical team from there. From Van Hagen, I learnt the true state of affairs at the front. During the general offensive, the Russians broke through the front and threw back our troops for several hundred kilometres. Once again, a whole army was killed. Once again, there was general panic. I asked Van Hagen, Do you think we can stop them? On the Niemann, maybe. That is, near Grodno. Another hundred kilometers. How do the soldiers take it all? I can't believe they're still enduring all the hardships. They fight like devils, even though they're exhausted to the last degree. And what about the Russians? The Russians, they're feeling fine. Today they received a whole artillery division as a resupply. They can give us a real fireworks display and we have nothing to answer it with. What's your impression of the new division, Commander? No, capable, but very reserved. It's impossible to talk to him. A party functionary? I don't think so. He makes quite a decent impression. He's also very educated, so I don't think he's a party nominee. But remember, he's a big snob. Now, my dear fellow, lend me a pair of gloves for a while. I must introduce myself to him. Gloves were an indispensable item of uniform when reporting to a general, the last relic of medieval chivalry. After a few days retreat it, became quite clear that it would be to our great advantage to keep one of the operating brigades close to division headquarters. In this case, it was much closer to the front line than before but now we had the opportunity to receive the latest information on the situation at the front. In addition, I could at least roughly know when our units were going to withdraw. Now our decision to launch a complex operation was based only on the calculation of the time it might. Now the evacuation of the wounded became a very difficult matter. Ambulances assigned to individual regiments could not travel long distances. On the whole, and this time, the retreat was organized relatively well but there was no longer a permanent front line, and the enemy often wedged in between our units. The number of ambulances allocated to the forward units was greatly reduced, and our own unit found itself responsible for transporting a large number of wounded from the most distant point. If the ambulance did not get back quickly enough to where the regimental first aid station was located, it could change its location in the meantime, and the wounded could simply be left where they were. When the wounded were with us, the risk of them falling into enemy hands became much less. Whether or not the Russians provided medical assistance to German prisoners, no one knew for sure. Sir Company had some difficulty in placing the 2nd Operating Brigade in the rear. This meant that we would be wasting valuable time. The distance between the two brigades proved to be too short, and consequently the wounded would soon have to be evacuated again. What this meant for the wounded, was that their journey would be delayed by three or four stages until they were in a safe place. Such a complex system worked quite smoothly, although this would hardly have been possible if it had been based on orders alone. It worked so well only because the people involved felt legitimately proud 
that they had not left a single casualty behind. All the successes of the ambulance drivers were all the more remarkable because their dedication was largely vast. No one could supervise them. They always had to make the necessary decisions themselves. They worked almost without sleep. During the day they might come under fire and at night they might be ambushed by partisans. It's the possibility that they might get lost and end up in territory already occupied by the enemy could never be ruled out. One night I approached an ambulance that had just arrived and asked the driver what wounded he had brought with him. There was a huge hole in the driver's cab door, and when he tried to get out he suddenly lost consciousness. I opened the door myself, and he fell out of the cab right into my arms. His left leg was torn off. About a kilometre and a half from the village, a shell exploded near his car, and he drove the rest of the distance with his right foot on the clutch. Inside the ambulance were three seriously wounded men. If he had stopped the car, they would surely have been killed. Only half an hour later, the Russians had broken through to the outskirts of the village. We put a bandage on the driver's wounded leg, and then put him and the three wounded he had brought in another ambulance, and the new driver took them to the rear 